Good evening and welcome. I am very excited to be here with Gary Soto tonight. Um, Gary was raised in Fresno, California. He's the author of 13 poetry collections for adults, most notably new and selected poems. He's a 1995 finalist for both the LA Times Award and the National Book Award. He has received the Discovery, the Nation Prize, and the California Liberty Library Associations. John and Patricia Ward twice. In addition to fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts twice and the Guggenheim Foundation. For ITVS, he produced the film, The Pool Party, which received the 1993 Andrew Carnegie Medal. In 1995, for his work with young people, he was selected NBC Person of the Week. In 1999, he was honored with the Human and Civil Rights Award from the American Education Association, the Literature Award, from the Hispanic Heritage Foundation and the Penn Center West Book Award for his young adult short story collection, Petty Crimes. Several of his books have been translated into French, Hindu, Italian, Japanese, Korean, and Spanish, and he currently lives in Berkeley, California. That's Welcome, it. Gary. Everything Professor Buchanan said is true, okay? <laughs> oh, I'm making it up. I actually, I'm, Oh boy, it's kind of impressive. I like that. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be in Porterville. Uh, I was here about 20 years ago. I got a ticket over here on that street at 190. And <laughs> uh, lost a hubcap over there as well. So, so I have, but I still, I still have fond memories of your community. I think I saw the hubcap when I was going by on 190. So I was, a, I was born and raised in Fresno. And um, you know, I, the reason why I became a writer First, I graduated from high school with a 1.6 GPA. So you have to ask yourself, well, how is this Javala going to be a, a writer? I didn't know, except it was 1970, and those my age, um, they, they can remember they're, they're that age, um, the Vietnam War was on, and if you didn't go uh, to a community college, you were drafted. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. There was something called a lottery. So I followed my brother to Fresno City College, and uh, what do you do in college? Well, you study a little bit, but you also fall in love. You know, that's kind of a natural thing. So I asked this girl, I liked her a lot. Her name is Sandra. I won't mention her last name, Benitez. And uh, <laughs> I was in love with her, and I asked, I asked her, hey, would you like to marry me? I mean, I was only 19, man, and, I, and she said, chale, no way, Jose. <laughs> and so, Heartbroken, I went to the library on campus and began to check out books of poetry to repair my broken heart. You know, man, love hurts. I mean, really, I've, uh, you know, I saw, uh, uh, I saw my friend Sandra a while ago, and I'm glad she went that way, and I went this way, you know, and, um, but she's doing well in life. So, you know, I only mention that because I have a very romantic poem called Oranges, and it's, I'm going to see if I can remember it by, by, uh, well, see if I can remember it. It's called Oranges. It's by going out with a girl. You're 13 years old. You're testing the waters of romance. And, uh, and yeah, it's in Fresno. We had a Fulton Mall. And so that's where we took, uh, you know, our kind of walk our date around and so on. I don't think I can remember the poem, but so I have to just see if I could find it here in this collection here. Okay, let's see. Oranges, where are you? You're on page 72. The first time I went out with a girl, I was 13 years old, cold, and weighted down with two oranges in my jacket. It was December, there was frost cracking beneath my steps, my breath before me then gone as I walked toward her house, the one whose porch light burned yellow night and day in any weather. I smiled, touched her shoulder, and led her down the street, across a used car lot in a line of newly planted trees until we were standing before a drugstore. We entered the drugstore, the tiny bell bringing a sales lady down a narrow aisle of goods. I turned to the candies, teared like bleachers, and asked what she wanted. Light in her eyes, a smile starting at the corners of her mouth. I fingered a nickel in my pocket, and when she lifted a chocolate that cost a dime, I didn't say anything. 
I took the nickel from my pocket and then an orange and set them both quietly on the counter. When I looked up, the sales lady's eyes met mine and held them, knowing very well what it was all about, love I mean. Outside the drugstore, a few cars hissing past, fog hanging like old coats between the trees. I took my girl's hand in mine for two blocks, then released it to let her unwrap her chocolate. I peeled my orange that was so bright against the gray of December that from some distance, someone might have thought I was making a fire in my hands. Okay, I'm a romantic, okay, and um, this was, uh, I won't mention her name, Veronica, and uh, so I don't know what happened to Veronica, but she, you know, she went on in life and so on. So I started off as a poet, you know, uh, after this girl, Sandra, hurt my feelings, I went to the library and began to check out books of poetry. And the interesting thing is that, again, I graduated from high school at 1.6 GPA. In fact, high school was kind of a hard, hard time for me. You know, you, all guys, some women, you know, they go out for sports. And my sport in high school was wrestling. And man, I was no good. Uh, the first time I wrestled, I was pinned in 13 seconds. The girl was really tough. And uh, so, you know, that wasn't going to happen for me. So what do you do? You know, like, uh, you know, just kind of drift through high school. And I think I had some, uh, some, you know, some little problems that way. I bring up romance because in this play called Nerdlandia, it's about a nerd. He's from Fresno. He wears his pantalones way up here. He has a little corbata here. He has uh, some lentes on his face, it's all messed up. And he's a certified nerd. And interesting, he falls in love with a chola from uh, Porterville. Okay, could be Porterville. So, you know, so his name is um, Martin again. And there's a, a gangster wannabe by the name of Joaquin. And Joaquin is kind of like really not a gangster, but in the play he is. And it is a comedy. So we don't need to, uh, we'll put down our phones, please. Yeah, we'll just be with ourselves here. And um, so he's a, you know, he's a good guy. But this is how the play goes, the beginning of the play. Hey, Martin, how come you're making la jeta, man, the long face? And Martin, the nerd, turns away. Come on, man, what's wrong with you, Holmes? Nothing's wrong. I'm happy. You ain't happy, man. What's with you? Que pasó? Really, I'm fine. Let me guess, man. Oh, 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 let me see. Let me guess, you didn't make the football team, is that right? No, I didn't go out for football. It's a joke, I say, man, I know you didn't go for football. Pues, if we had, our team would be 0-7. Or no, 0-3 like the 49ers. I got it, man. Your microscope broke, huh? And Martin the nerd wags his head no. Hey, your ant farm got sprayed with black flag, huh? Is that, is that it? No, I, my ant farm works fine. And so is my goldfish and my hamster, Melvin. Man, ever since you and me first met in kindergarten, and I was there two years getting my colors down really good, you've been into this science stuff, man. I used to think that you were all, you were all tapado, man, all stuck up, but no, man, I was wrong. You're just a nerd. I figure your kind of people, nerds, and my kind of people, vatos, we gotta come together. Yeah, I know what's wrong. Your calculator broke, huh? No, my calculator works fine, but thank you. Thank you for asking. If I tell you, you won't laugh, will you? And Joaquin, the gangster wannabe, puts on a straight face. He feels a little sensitive toward his friend. Laugh? Laugh at the bottle who helps me in biology, who whispers in my ears to answers to algebra, who fills me with history during finals. So what's going down? It's, it's my heart. Tu corazón? Yes, my corazón. Love palpitations. Love palpitations, that's a hard one to fix. Tu sabes when you fool, fool the heart, man, it's, it's muy delicado, man. You gotta get inside a person and, and change things around. But sometimes, sometimes it's gotta be done. You, you know how to repair a broken heart? Simon, man, I'm a heart surgeon of all heart surgeons, a specialist when it comes to romance. Shoot, last week I was on the phone with, uh, oh my gosh, she's an oldie but goodie uh, lover type. Uh, who's a, who's a uh, current heart th throb among teen girls? Does anyone know? <laughs> I'll put Justin Bieber. I was on the phone with Justin Bieber. 
The vato was all heartbroken, man. He was crying because his girl dumped him right in front of that boy, loco. <laughs> Justin Bieber, he was crying like a rain cloud. And then in plays, you often have like uh, minor characters. And the minor characters are this, these two guys, these two uh, locos named Freddy and Tito. So they come in. Joaquin, mira, here comes nuestro canales, man, Freddy and Tito. And they do a very elaborate rasa handshake. It takes about a half an hour to finish. And uh, Freddy, man, I got carpal tunnel syndrome from these handshakes. So what's going down, Holmes? Uh, what's wrong with what, Joaquin? What, Joaquin? Unemployment, crime, placas, and Marty's broken heart, man. He's heartbroken. Freddy, Junior Einstein is heartbroken? When I saw his long cara, man, I thought it was calculator was broke. And I thought, that's what I thought too, Holmes. And they do another set of handshakes. Tito to Joaquin. Hey, guess what? Joaquin mocking Tito. Hey, I don't know. Tito, Freddy found a part-time job. Freddy smiles. Yeah, washing dishes at a Chinese restaurant, man. I'm going to carry on the family tradition, man. <laughs> and so the play goes on. And it's, uh, it's uh, boy meets girl. And uh, he falls in love with this chola from Porterville. <laughs> or she could be from Porterville. OK, so one of the things that I have to do is kind of make fun of Arasa in a good way. And we, we are filled with weaknesses and also strengths. And I'm really interested in kind of like the, 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 the kind of the funny nature of our, uh, of our, our um, well, you know, our, our weaknesses. And so I'm going to read you just a part. It's called, where in the heck is it here? Well, I would, I'm just going to, uh, no, it's not in this book. I wonder what happened to it. Well, anyhow, it's the weakness is this. Uh, uh, it's called Sorry, Wrong Family. And sometimes when I was a boy, um, I was embarrassed of my parents because we had like four kids in there. My mom used to pick us up from school and there was this big old station wagon, Van Gansai Gary! You know, she yelled and, and there was fingerprints all over the, uh, the windows. And my mom had like curlers on the top of her hair. And she had a big old mumu ja uh, dress and uh, slippers. And, you know, I said, oh, man. I said, who's that? I said, I don't know, but uh, I better get in the car, you know, with her. <laughs> so all of us have been embarrassed by our parents. I remember my uh, stepfather. I remember going you know, around the corner with a, a friend of mine, and, uh, and I said, I got closer. I saw my stepfather in the lawn. He's, he's like watering the lawn like this. And uh, I thought he's wearing a brown, he's wearing a brown uh, T-shirt. But as I got closer and closer, it was not a brown. He was just... Uh, bare-chested, so his big bonson was like this. He's like, I said, I don't know, man. Uh, so it's family's OK, you know, but family can also be uh, embarrassing as well. So one of the things I have to do is actually kind of elicit some of the um, strange moments in, the, in my life. And not everything that I write about is actually true. Some of it's all fiction. And this is a poem um, of mine. Oh, it's actually in this one. How many have, have made tortillas? OK. Now, I know all of us have eaten them. So I know, of course. People, I don't know, man. Back, I went back east 20 years ago, and I said, actually, what I had, I, was, I saw these tortillas in the, they were in a can. You know, like, uh, like they were, you know, you had to unroll it like this. So it was like a really foreign food. And I go, man, I, I, had, I, should have, I didn't have a camera at the time, but I should have taken a picture of that. So this is a poem about making tortillas. And, um, and I asked if some of you have made tortillas. And you, I know we've all enjoyed them. So this is a poem called Tortillas Like Africa. So just, just to uh, kind of uh, introduce the poem, so I'm at the stove, and I'm making tortillas. And they're coming out not like round, but they're coming out like looking like uh, Johnny's or something. You know, they come out like all wango or something. You know, like uh, they're not they're not perfectly round. <laughs> when my primo Isaac and me squeezed dough over a mixing bowl, when we dusted the cu uh, cutting board with flour, when we spanked and palmed our balls of dough, when we said here goes and began rolling that tortillas. We giggled because ours came in not round like mama's, 
but in the shape of faraway lands. Here was Africa. Here was Colombia and Greenland. Here was Italy, the boot country, and here was Mexico, our homeland to the south. Here was Chile, thin as a tie. Here was France, square as a hat. Here was Australia with patches of jumping kangaroos. We rolled out our tortillas on the board and laughed when we threw, threw them on the comal. These tortillas that were not round as the pock moon, but the twist and stretch of the earth taking shape. So, so we rolled out our tortillas, our first batch, laughing. So we wrapped them in a dish towel. So we buttered and rolled two each and sat on the front porch. Butter ran down our arms and our faces, shone. I asked my primo, man, how's your tortilla? He cleared his throat and opened up his tortilla. He said, bueno, Greenland tastes like Mexico. <laughs> Okay, so I, I started writing poetry in 1974, 75, around that time. Graduated, from, uh, I'm a bulldog from Fresno State. And uh, so then I went to Irvine. The, uh, to, there's a program, a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing, and with a, went with another guy from, uh, from Fresno as well, so we were roommates. And it was a good time. So that has been my profession, and it's a really kind of interesting profession because uh, uh, you probably don't know how books are made, but most of publishing takes place in New York, and they decide on, on the, uh, the makeup of literature in our country. So this, sometimes they can be problematic because they don't know about Mexican-Americans or Latinos or Chicanos or Mexicanos. And so it's kind of like we have to almost educate what's going on uh, for those people stationed in, in, um, in New York City, where the main central uh, publishing world is. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, uh, I write about family. And uh, how many of I have a uh, story in here. I'm not going to read the story, but I'm going to just tell you about the story. Uh, how many ever wore anything that your mother bought you that you absolutely hated? And uh, I see some of you are wearing it right now. And uh, <laughs> this is a well-dressed Porterville here. You know, because you know, I remember my mom, she said, uh, Gary, what are you, what kind of, uh, you need a new jacket. I was wearing like a, you know, nothing, man. And I go, oh, mom. So I want a green, I want a, a, a leather jacket, black leather jacket with some, these little things called epaulets, little, little things here, some stars. I was really going to look good on my trainer, trainer, uh, trainer wheel bicycle. Uh, she went down to Kmart. Do we still have Kmart or are they gone? Oh, no. Muy triste. But anyway, she went to uh, Kmart and bought me a jacket made out of plastic, the color of Deo guacamole. And it was ugly. It was, like I said, she comes home and she said, here it is. And it's one of these jackets where you have to grow into it. You're like, oh, man. I got rid of it last year. Finally, I kind of outgrew it. So it's kind of like what they call bittersweet. You know, you kind of like, you like the, uh, the gesture of your mom buying you something, but then you have to wear this thing. And, uh, you know, I intended to be like um, six foot two, you know. You know, you know, uh, wapo with this, this, this terrific body. But this kind of, this jacket kind of shunned, you know, stunned my growth. You know, I kind of stayed down here for a long time. And it was really interesting how clothes, how, and I think some of us do believe that clothes do affect us. And, um, uh, the shoes you might have worn in junior high. Oh man, do I have to wear these, Mom? Uh, or this these jacket, or these uh, these article of clothing that you just um, you. Not, I'm not sure the word is despite, but it's uh, or spite, but it, it really does kind of affect you. And um, this jacket did. In fact, the, the, uh, it's so effective so much that the cover of the book uh, has a jacket. <laughs> I'm still in therapy. I oh, said so I'm, I'm getting over it. Okay. Okay. Let's see. What else we have here? Uh, oh yeah. Uh, I'm, I okay. I made tamales before. How many have made tamales before? Okay, I know. I know we all ate. I ate them. Okay, so that's cool. We got we got that down. Well, this is too many tamales, and it's about a little girl who who falls in love with her mom's ring, and I think it's not unusual for uh, children, boys and girls, to fall in love with an article of of clothing or, or a ring or a watch or something that belongs to your parents. I think that's just, just thing of, of growing up. 
In this case, this little girl falls in love with her mom's ring. And actually, it's beautiful, beautifully rendered. Here she is wearing her mom's ring on, on her thumb. And it's kind of like a, it's kind of what they call a cautionary tale. Is that, uh, I don't know if kids are really going to believe this, but um, when you read something and you actually, okay, you, you, uh, you learn from that. Because one of the things about literature, it's, it's not instructional. Uh, you don't read a, uh, a novel and say, okay, I learned how to behave. You know, otherwise, I would have been behave, behaving, behaving a long time ago. But it's, it's really the story that kind of in, uh, is enticing. So this little girl, she has to find the tamale. I mean, uh, she has to eat these 24 tamales to find out where, which tamale holds the ring. Because when she was making the masa, this action, it disappears in there. But she doesn't know which one. And she, she doesn't need all 24. She has cousins who help her along. So it's, you know, what they call a cautionary tale. And it's not like in this, this story here. Oh, this is my favorite here. Chato's Kitchen. It's about a low riding S.A. Vato cat from Porterville. Okay. <laughs> I saw him on uh, 190. I'm sorry. He didn't get across the street. So he's a. Uh, well, he did get across the street. Chato is a low, you know, he's again, uh, he falls in love with a couple of uh, a f a familia de ratoncitos, and they're moving into El Barrio, though. So he's like, he wants to eat them. And he has to figure out how to invite them over, not for dinner, but to become dinner. And this is the big, big thing, the big premise in this story, is that he has to figure out how to, to invite them over. And I won't ruin it for you, um, uh, but this was, okay, I have to tell you something, though. This is a book banned in Clovis, California. It was banned, and why? Because uh, it sort of portrayed Mexican-Americans in, uh, in a light that suggested they were gangsters, you know, cholos from, uh, from the area of Fresno. So it was a big old pedo over there in, uh, in, uh, <laughs> in Clovis, you know, and uh, it was actually, it was 1995, it was banned. And uh, so they said that it was banned, and, they were, and uh, one parent, there's always like one parent who complained, you know, so they take it. So if you wanted to check this book out, honest to goodness, man, it was behind a caged uh, shelf in the library. And uh, the librarian had the key right here. So when are, you, are you sure you want to check out Chato's Kitchen? <laughs> yeah, man. I want to check it out. So she take the thing off and open it up. Here it is. So then they, they invited me over. Clovis uh, Unified invited me over. And they said, OK, come over and uh, talk to our kids. All right, OK, I'll do that. So they were like a line of administrators, I don't know, waiting for to greet me. They thought I had a ranfla, you know, kind of like a whole lot, you know, how you know, I draw like so I was getting out of my car with a banana. And, you, know. you know, it's interesting how people interpret literature. Because anyone who's reading a book is not going to be, you know, kind of like a, a bad element in the world. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. Literature, why it, it makes better people, and um, I did say it's not instructional. I mean, that's you don't read this book, and then you kind of apply it to your life. But there's some something in the core of a story that does affect you, and it always affects you in a good way. You know, whether even the story if it's kind of sad, uh, it affects you in a, in a in a very meaningful way. Okay, I'm going to stop here for a second. Uh, Porterville, I want you to ask me a question or two about writing books or the career um, uh, of writing. Uh, so let's start right now. Sir, over here. What made you start the writing books? I think I, I told you earlier on that girl, Sandra Benitez, man, uh, she hurt my feelings back in 1972. But actually, but one thing is that uh, actually, sir, I, I, I say that jokingly. It really, didn't she didn't affect me that way? But I think what uh, the thing is, in nineteen in the sixties and seventies, one of the highest uh, occupations you could have was to become a writer. You know, I really wanted to be like, uh, uh, even though my, you know, we come from a family of campesinos. We just worked in the fields, uh, cotton, beets, uh, grapes. We did that work. We were, uh, we were janitors. Uh, mainly in our uh, in our household, where warehouse people as well, and so. But I really wanted to do so. I don't. There was something there that said I wanted to do this, even there was no evidence. So when my first book came out, it was called The Elements of San Joaquin, 1977. Uh, 
It was accepted for 1976. My grandmother from uh, uh, Aguascalientes, she didn't know how to read neither Spanish nor English, but she understood it was, understood it was a moment in the Soto family. And so she took my book and she put it in a picture frame. She put it in a picture frame and she put it on the television. And that was like the highest honor that she had to be one of these doilies that were really kind of you know, stiff and starchy. And I'm right there like, uh, so she could watch her telenovelas and look at my book. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you don't, it was a start, you know, like, oh man, Gary's doing something different. And, uh, you know, we had some people, you know, a couple of us went to uh, the big car, uh, well, they went to prison, road camp, we call it road camp at the time, prison. And uh, they would paint rocks, you know, like, uh, they were like, you know, drunk and driving, you know, with minor offenses, which I think are, can be real serious as well, but, um, so to answer your question, I felt like there was something inside me that wanted to come out, uh, but uh, there was no indication. You know one of the things I wanted to be? I wanted to be a, 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 a rocker. You know, like, you know, everybody has kind of like dream, oh man. You know, I wanted to be, you know, get all the music from the 60s. I so said, I want to be like that, you know. But, uh, you know, I can't sing. <laughs> I can't play a musical instrument. And uh, so, the, you know, that kind of ended my, uh, my career. So I thought it was. Okay, uh, another question from someone else. Yeah, young man here. So I'm assuming you went home one day and just started to write, write, write ideas, some inspiration dates. How did you get your work out there? How did you get that recognition? You know, the thing is, this is 1972, 73, and I felt there was something inside me. My brother was an artist, and a pretty good artist. He was a good artist. And so I was, we were living on, uh, you know, all of you, a lot of you are in college, so you're going through what they call college poverty. And so, like, when, in the morning, when I asked Hermana, what should we have for breakfast? And he goes, pues, frijoles. <laughs> How about lunch? <laughs> frijoles. <laughs> y, y dinner? And I go, mas frijoles. <laughs> so it's kind of like uh, we're going through college poverty, this, what they call the starving artist period. And that, I ended that about last week, but um, <laughs> it goes on for a long time. So one of the things I, I, I really wanted to do it, and not, not sometimes we kind of got to kid ourselves. You know, we, we get into something and we stay with it for a long, long time, and it seems to work. You know, I tried martial arts. You know, like I was terrible martial arts. I tried uh, wrestling. I was a terrible wrestler. I tried singing in a choir, uh, and I was immediately dis dismissed. You know. Uh, <laughs> In fact, this was a Catholic school, 19, uh, St. John's Elementary in Fresno, and they dismissed me. And they, they were like, they were singing a you know, Christian song, and then they go, you. I, so I thought, he, I thought I, he was proud of me, so he could stand right here. And then, and then he listened to me, he goes, there's the door. And he went like that, he's just kind of like, and all of a sudden I'm standing up here looking at, uh, you know, St. Joseph, man, uh, St. John, he was standing right there, kind of like this, kind of post posture. So you kind of understand that you want to do this thing, but it's, it's a long dedication. It's not, it's not easy. Not at easy, easy at all. Question over here on that side? Oh. Yeah. So I kind of to Alan this question. How did you get New York? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't answer that question. You know, one of the things that uh, our country has a lot of literary magazines, and it's kind of like uh, when you go to uh, like an MFA, you work on a Master of Fine Arts, there's a bunch of writers, it's kind of like you hear, you know, word of mouth magazines. You know what the literary magazines out there, the New Yorker, Poetry Magazine, New Republic, so you're sending to Iowa Review, you're sending your work out, and they send it back, or they take it. And so it's kind of like you, you have to put your poems inside their self-addressed envelope, you send it out, you wait, wait a month, month and a half, and they send it back rejected or t taken. And uh, so it's a kind of a slow snowball effect. It's, kind of, it's, um, it's like anything you, 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 if in the film industry, the same thing, you have, to, you have to hustle a little bit. Question over here, young lady. What are some of your uh, biggest um, obstacles that you have to overcome? As a I think one of the uh, question is, what is one of your obstacles? One of the things is that uh, I think for maybe some of you here, I don't know if it's, this is true, but being like the first in your family to go to a, a college, you know, kind of like you don't, you don't, you have a lot of doubts about yourself, your skills, you know, whether you belong there, uh, the pressures at home, pressures maybe of not having enough money to, you know, buy your textbooks and so on. So a lot of doubt, a, a lot of doubt. 
And then I kind of came from a dysfunctional family, and so that didn't help at all, you know. Uh, so it, it, but you know, you, you kind of like, you have to stay with it, you know. And you start piling up. I was really, you know, I was got C's and D's in high school. Then when I got my first B, I mean, I was, very, I was really excited. I, wow, this is cool. And then I started learning the, uh, the parts of speech, you know, adjective, adverb, conjunction, noun, pronoun, uh, and so on. And I was looking at a noun. I didn't know what noun was in the first year of college, a noun. And I turned to my brother, I said, man, Rick, you're a noun. And uh, <laughs> you're a person. I'm, I, I'm a noun? He goes, yeah, you're a noun. <laughs> oh my god. And, uh, I'm already a qualified noun? Like, yeah. So it's, you, know, you start learning uh, things. And you kind of, you go, you, you, all this uh, knowledge begins to, uh, and you don't think, oh, I don't forget everything in, in history, you forgot anything in literature. You don't. It's somehow it's there in your, in your, in your memory. It, it never disappears. Uh, the only thing that disappears is math. I was trying some math recently. <laughs> yeah. Man, that kind of like the multiplication thing, after a while, division. So I, t I have my wife do it. I said, uh, <coughs> I suppose uh, you, I think you should handle the, uh, the checking over here. Of course, I don't know how to do it. So I think so, see, that's her role, or one of her roles. One more question, then I'm going to uh, go to something else here. Yes, please. Uh, is it uh, Anna? Yes. Yeah, OK. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I was wondering if you have a special place you go to that inspires you to write when you start writing. You know, uh, the question is, do you have a special place? Uh, I like my couch. You know, <laughs> uh, how many like their couch or, or their bed, you know? I have two places, my couch and my bed. I have a little uh, oficina there, and it's kind of funky a little bit. I don't like it. There's some vibe there that I don't quite like. But the couch, you know, I kind of like to sit there and write and so on. Of course, I have a laptop like everyone else, and uh, I do my you know, word processing that way. But I, you know, I think that's, I, I don't go around like into a park going, hmm, that evergreen there. Well, it sure is inspiring there. <laughs> Oh, that pond over there, oh my gosh. I haven't seen a pond like that in years. You know, I, I don't do that, you know. But I do appreciate, you know, like the great uh, English poet Wordsworth. You know, he was affected by nature. And I think it could be very profound on people. But uh, and I sit on my couch. So that, that's a really wonderful place. My book called The Afterlife, and it's about a uh, young boy you know, we say things that uh, sometimes get us in trouble. Uh, uh, you know, you don't mean to get in yourself in trouble, but you do. It just comes out of your mouth. And in this case, this kid, young man, in the story, beginning, it's really kind of not, uh, in spite of the themes, teen murder, teen suicide. Uh, in spite of those two themes, they're in high school. Both the, uh, the young man is a, a murder victim, the young woman is a suicide. You know, in spite of that, it's a comedy. And it's like, how can this be a comedy? Well, there, there, it, it is a romance, and it is a comedy, but it's also a reflection on our mortality. I mean, how brief our, our time is on this planet. And um, so he says to this guy, and, he, and they're, they're at, a, at, a, at a club, and he's getting used in the bathroom, and he turns to a guy, and he says, hey, man, I like your yellow shoes. And the guy thinks, you, are you making fun of me, man? You know, and so he kills him. He kills uh, Chewie. So Chewie right away goes into the afterlife. The afterlife is that place, you know, if, I don't know if you have religious, you know, uh, platform in your life or not. But, you know, you know, some believe you go into this afterlife for three days, then you go up to heaven or you go to Fresno. And uh, <laughs> it's one of those two places. And um, so he ends up in Fresno. And um, so it's, and, and the girl, the young woman, is a, uh, she's a suicide. She has, as I uh, expressed to someone, she has doubts about herself. Even though she's a 4.0 and uh, she has applications here and there, you know, you could be really, really smart and still have doubts about your, your intellectual ability of your position in life, and so on. And so this is a story about that. And um, Chewie says this, and he's dead in the afterlife. No breath, and he looks behind him. No shadow to follow me around. He touches his face.
cold. He touches his heart. Heartbeat, I ain't got one, man. In death, you got the weight of a zero and the value of a zero. You just roll with the wind. So this is the afterlife, and in the play, he looks around. Do I stay here until God taps my shoulder and says, Venga conmigo. And then Chewie's baffled. Venga conmigo? Is God Mexican? Un <laughs> Mexicano? That'd be so freaky cool. I mean, I'm only 17 or was, and what am I now? A ghost? And the stage slowly darkens. I don't want to be here. I want to be at home on a couch, not here in this place. I'm dead, dead forever. And so it's kind of, that is kind of like a heavy scene there. And this play has been uh, produced. And so Choi, he wants to go, you know, you have three days, at least in this play, you have three days to kind of float around. So he's floating around Fresno. And he goes to a girl's bedroom. He, this girl, he likes this girl. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Her name is Rachel. And as soon as uh, Chewie is killed, uh, the you know, word gets out. You know, it's kind of like the dicho, man, I forget the dicho, but it kind of like, it go, kind of, once you're, something bad happens, it goes out, like a little cricket. So Rachel is on the phone. I can't believe it. It's so not real. He was s silly but sweet. And I was going to meet up, meet up with him at the uh, nightclub. It's so strange because we've known each other since fifth grade. Hold on. There's a buzz on her phone. Hold on. You heard? It's all messed up. I knew him since third grade. He was good at kickball but couldn't spell worth for frijoles. Wait a second. No, I don't know when the funeral is but I knew him when he was in kindergarten. So this girl kind of like, uh, she kind of, she didn't like him, really. But as, because he's dead, she said, oh, we go back, way back to kindergarten. And she actually makes it preschool. And so it's, um, and it's actually, again, it's a comedy, romance, slash, tragedy, slash, reflection. Okay, ask me a question. Well, this is a play, a one-act play, and um, based on one of my uh, young adult novels. It's good to be here in uh, Porterville. I'm gonna find that hubcap, man, I lost 20 years ago. I know it's on that 190, man. I'm gonna just drive real slow, kind of. Okay, ask me a question about writing books or education or. Way back there, please. Hi. First of all, thank you for being here. It's an honor to have you at Porterville mm -hmm. College. Um, you showed in, your, in one of the books, Tamales, yeah. the illustrations. What is the process of finding or or uh, selecting your illustrators? Okay, I've, I've done about eight or nine uh, picture books, uh, and um, you, you have no, uh, you're not in a position to, to choose the illustrator. It's the companies that choose them. Uh, the publisher chooses the, and you really don't, sometimes you don't know what the book is gonna look like until you, uh, you get in the mail, and then that's it. There's no changing of, uh, uh, changing of the, uh, representation of the images inside the book. So, you know, it, uh, it's interesting that way. Okay, I mentioned I had uh, nine picture books, um, and four are still in print. The way the industry works is this way. If a book doesn't sell well, then it's what they call remaindered. And by that, it's taken out of circulation, and invariably, it's, it's, it's put in, the, um, in a shredder, so they just shred the book up. Because if they keep it in the warehouse, there's a tax on that book or something like that. So they can't be, they don't want to be taxed. So a lot of the books that I've written are out of print. And that's just the way of the world. And it's just like, it's like, um, it's like music. Uh, I don't know who was, uh, oh, like, oh, there's a group called Menudo. Remember that group? <laughs> now, I don't know where Menudo is this day. Are they around? Uh, I, I, don't, I mean, I know what Menudo, Menudo is, but, uh, you know, the group, you know, you know, and I think they've had some interesting, profound music, but it's like everything. It has, it has its uh, expiration date. You know, things go by, and, uh, and things, if they don't sell, if books don't sell, music doesn't sell, films don't sell, clothing doesn't sell, then, then it's, it's remaindered or, or it's out of fashion. And so that's the way, way of the world, but so I don't choose my illustrator. Okay. Uh, one more question here. Yes, young man, one, uh, yes. 
Uh, do you have a book in particular that you spent a lot of time on that didn't sell well or do as well as you hoped for? Where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> I work really hard on all of them. <laughs> no, none of them sell. Um, actually, I say that jokingly. Yeah, let's see here. I have a play, it's an unpublished play. It's the funniest thing. It's called Gormax. And Gormax is a, 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 is a one act play. And it's about two boys who decide to form a rock group. And you know, they're 16, 17 years old. They're uh, them as boards. You know, they're boys, you know, like they're in high school, you know, like eating Cheetos all day. And uh, I say, hey, yeah, let's, let's, let's fly, uh, start our uh, a group. And I go, okay. Uh, one's named Sean and Jason, it's kind of typical names. And uh, uh, so they form a group. And their, their, their thing is this, is that they don't sing and they don't play a musical instrument. All they do is get up on the stage and just look at the audience. And it's kind of like a, 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 a joke. And it's where music has gone so far, almost all the songs sound the same. So their thing is going to be like, we're just going to look at the girl, girls, flirt with them, and uh, we'll be a sensation. And are they a sensation? Yes. They're world known, and they have a parrot in the act. A little parrot. It's a bilingual parrot. Actually, a trilingual parrot. And um, you asked, this is ridiculous, Gary. Are you having a seizure here? No. There was a, uh, a composer, classical composer, by the name of John Cage. John Cage came up with a song, or I don't know what's a song, a composition where he sat at the piano for three minutes and 44 seconds sat at the piano, and you can look him up right now, after, after the presentation here, and three minutes, 44 seconds. And it's a classic. It's one of the, uh, 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 and he didn't do anything. He just sat there like this, and then left the stage in great applause. You know, and I said, I don't mean, I'm not gonna say anything about John Cage, because I don't know enough about music. But to me, man, if some guy stood up there for three minutes and did nothing, uh, I don't know if it's, Art? Is it art? But it, uh, it is, a, uh, it is a, um, a moment. I am going to ask someone, just one person here, to look up John Cage, 3 minutes, 44 seconds. Or four, maybe it's 14 seconds on your phone and see if I'm making this up. Somebody with a phone right now. You guys all have phones. <laughs> I don't have a phone. OK. Um, So, so, so my play is called Gormax. I really worked hard on this uh, play, and I really, I mean, I put a, but there was no one interested in this, this, uh, this work, in part because I wrote it during the pandemic, and all theater closed down. So there's no like way to, you know, like uh, get the play up and mounted. The Afterlife was in production in Oakland, California. It played in ten different high schools. It actually went to Europe as well, and. Um, it closed down, and it'll never be, you know, uh, performed again. I mean, that was, I had my time, it was there, and it just, just shut down. And that's just the way, you know, I can live with that. Uh, okay, anybody find John Cage? Did you yeah. find? Yeah. Hey, am I making it up? No. Okay, I'm not making it up. So I, the thing is, like, uh, how is this possible, man? We have, some guy comes up here, sits here, and becomes a world sensation. And so my characters... And they're named J Jason and um, Sean. They changed their names to uh, Metallic Z and uh, Low L, as uh, just L O slash L. And they, that's the rocker names. Like, you have to have an interesting name. And uh, speaking of names, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I'm uh, Mexican American, and uh, I got the name Gary. What were my parents thinking, man? I said, Gary, come on, man. <laughs> What I really wanted was not a Latino name, but I wanted a really badass name. I wanted Demetrius. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, people be like, oh, you know, like parting the ways, and here comes Demetrius, you know. <laughs> but that didn't happen. You know, I got this name, Gary. And there's a lot of uh, people from my generation from the 50s, uh, Mexican American, Asian American, Black American, White American, that have a lot of Gary names. And that's just, uh, that's just the way of the world. And if you ever see another Gary in the, on the planet, he's going to be my age, if not older. Um, and that, that's, that's another truth. OK, let's see. What else do we have here? Oh, yeah. You 
know, this is a realistic book. It's called Gabe here. And I'm just going to read you a portion of the beginning. And we're going to uh, end here just a bit. Called Gabe. As Gabe Mendoza approached the downtown library, miserably sweaty, he scolded himself for forgetting his baseball cap. The afternoon was hot, maddening hot. He stopped under a tree and spied the temperature on the corner of the bank, 104 degrees. Through the wavering heat, he eyed a figure in a 49er sweatshirt. Dang, Gabe thought. What's wrong with this dude? A sweatshirt in this heat? Son, the figure beckoned to him. Son, Gabe wondered. Was this homeless man looking for a handout? It's me, your dad. The figure in dirty clothes was pulling a large suitcase on wheels. The man did his best to hoist a smile. The vagrant did resemble his dad, whom Gabe hadn't seen in four years. His dad had driven away in the family's best car with his clothes and a household computer in the back seat. And, and the story goes on. So it's, a, it's an encounter with a deadbeat father who simply shows up in his life and wants to establish a relationship with the son. This is not comedy. This is really a really hard story here. But you know, the space of time when he's uh, 13 to uh, four years earlier, in, in youth, in childhood, that's a big span of time. You know, like uh, there's a lot of things that happen in, in four years. Uh, at my age, people in their 60s, 70s, 50s, four years is not too long. But for four years, he's in fifth grade, and by the time he sees his dead beat dad, he's in uh, you know eighth grade. Some, some, I think that's he's in eighth grade here. So again, it's it's because I set up the premise. I set up the premise. What is he going to do with his dad? His dad has shown up. He wants to establish a relationship. His dad is still going through some heavy problems. And it's sort of like um, the end is actually happy. But um, you know, it's kind of a, um, a decision whether he should accept him in his life or just let him go by. Now this is what they call a novella. A novella is, uh, when Spanish is a novella, is a, is a full length uh, novel. But in English, it's a, it's a short novel. And, uh, and I think that um, I couldn't make it a, 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 a larger text. I just didn't feel like it was going to be that thing of a larger text. I just had one thing to ask. Is he going to be a friend with his dad or let him go? And it wasn't going to take a, it wasn't a short story, it wasn't a novel, but it's something in, in between here. So I've worked in all genres. I've worked in uh, uh, playwriting. I did a really bad movie. In fact, it was shown here in Porterville at one of your, uh, what, what is the couple of names of your uh, elementary schools here? Give me a, see if I can re remember them. Vendelia. Vendelia. No, not that one. West. Doyle. 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 I, I did a presentation there in 1993. I showed the movie there, and the kids asked, is this a comedy? And, uh, so, and it was a comedy. And uh, apparently, I, I guess my film years were over with, so I, I stopped with the pool party. Filmmaking is hard, and uh, I'm making a film right now. It's based on one of my novels. It's called Buried Onions. We filmed it in Fresno in May and the first week in June, and then it got really hot. Luckily, we, we got out of the, you know, we didn't experience the heat. So it was, uh, we had some scenes in the fields as well. But man, um, the cinema gods were with us because it was not hot. And of course, about three or about a month ago, it was really hot here in the valley. Yeah, I heard about it, yeah. I have a joke to tell you. The joke is this. It's about Fresno. So this, the, the caption is this, how to tell new arrivals in hell. And so these two guys show up, and there's flames and the devils and all that. And the two guys are going, boy, it's chilly down here. And um, just think about that. OK. Uh, well, two more questions. We're going to be out of here. Uh, I wanna, uh, Mallory, I want to thank her uh, for inviting me. Um, Reagan. Uh, the door. And they're, they're watching the door. the door, yeah. They're, they're by crowd control, okay? Want to keep everyone safe? Okay, two more questions. I'm going to be out here. It's really, it's a, one of the things I want to say is that I started off at a community college really, really struggling. I told you about discovering that my brother was a noun. And so if you're starting with that, 
uh, then everything else is frosty, man. You just, you just keep going up. So if you had a really kind of a rough high school years, or even rough now, you know, what are our options? I mean, really think about what are your options? Okay, two more questions. I don't want to preach to the uh, converted here. You know you have to stay here. Okay, the other thing, you have to stay here, but I don't mean like seven years, okay? You know? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't taken that class in the uh, home ec, you know? Yes, well, back there, was there a question, Han? Uh, yes? Oh, um, do you have um, a writer's association or poetry association? There are a lot of associations, uh, Poetry Society of America. There's groups. Uh, I don't belong to any writers groups and things of that. Uh, uh, and you know, other Mexican American writers kind of like it's kind of a weird world. We kind of like each other and don't like each other. <laughs> kind of like we're kind of jealous of each other. Uh, and in fact, what what happens? I'm not sure if a lot of Mexican American writers like me, because I publicly said one time they asked, "Well, this, I went. It was in Santa Cruz." I went over there and drove over there in Santa Cruz, nice ocean and all that stuff, the boardwalk. And uh, I went to it was a bookstore. So this big old Chicano dude, man, he has a big old bigote like this. <laughs> he had a big box on him sitting there looking at me all the time, like looking at me like evil. He goes, at the end of the presentation, he asked me, what has been your contribution to Chicano literature? And I said, man, I'm the first Chicano to write in complete sentences. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, I'm just asking, that's all, that's all. <laughs> so, you know, actually you say things like that and then you, you start a battle, man, among them, you're fighting each other and so on. It's good to be here in Porterville. You have a good evening and uh, please keep it up, okay? Thank you.